So we are getting ready to have an interview with a with the Democratic candidate for State Representative District 1, Mr. Brett Cecil. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to give him three minutes for some introductory statements and then we will I will be asking him questions. I'm with the League of Women Voters. We are nonpartisan and we are simply providing these interviews as an opportunity for the voting public to see and hear from their candidates and help them decide for whom they wish to vote. Mr. Cecil, you will have three minutes for your introduction. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate the time and I appreciate the League of Women Voters giving me the opportunity to make this recording. We wanted to do it in person, but here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> So again, my name is Brett Cecil. I am the Democratic nominee for state representative in the first district, which includes all of Curry County, some Southern parts of Coos County and some Western parts of Douglas County. And those lines have changed a little bit for this upcoming session, the next 10 years actually, until the next census. I'm a relative newcomer to Oregon. I moved to Port Orford specifically in 2017. And I came here after uh, my partner of many years had become um, ill in a very short, unexpected time period, passed away. And so I was left with cleaning up the things that needed to be taken care of after, after his passing and trying to live a life at the same time. I ended up living on our uh, small, it was a 10 acre chicken farm slash goat ranch in Ukiah, California. So I'm quite familiar with rural living as well as living in San Francisco and New York City. So I can go from high rise to, to chicken farm in a hot minute. I'm very comfortable with that. Um, and as far as my vocational background, I started out the end of my high school year working in a veterinary clinic as a veterinary assistant. And I've always had a, a penchant for animals and their, their needs and their care. I also worked in human medicine. And in that opportunity, I was able to to become familiar with computer systems. Way back in the day, I was doing some transcribing and working in medical records and human medicine. And it was a system called Wang for anybody who's familiar with word processing. And that capability moved me through human medicine into um, technical writing and te technical documents in the aerospace industry, working specifically for Northrop on the B-2 bomber project. And also moving from there into market research for the movie industry. And further along, I also was, was able to um, receive my certification to be a fitness instructor and a personal trainer, which I did for quite a few years. I found that really interesting, that one-on-one -on -one work with people and learning what their needs are and assessing their capabilities and their desires. And on top of that, my partner and I owned a, a number of rental units in San Francisco and other locales in California, as well as in Ukiah, California. So I have some experience around housing and being a tenant and being a landlord and being a builder and developer, that type of thing. So I think I bring a little bit of experience to some issues I think are, are really pending here in the district. And the first one I think that's I'm finding more key is about housing because we seem to have such a shortage, especially here along the coast, such a shortage of av available housing for people, especially young families. And to house our people and take care of our citizens well, we're gonna to have to consider our health care, which again, in our, our rural part of the state can be a little bit tricky because of the distance we have between our, our towns and locations. So the first question is um, what we consider to be of special importance to the coastal area. The Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has proposed two lease areas for floating wind power development. The fisheries community and other stakeholders have expressed concerns regarding placement of these structures in the proposed areas. What is your position regarding this proposal? I think the idea is fantastic in that we do need to address what our energy needs are gonna be moving into the future. As we've seen how fuel prices have increased and we're going to have to start working ourselves off of those fossil fuels 
and not only becoming energy independent, but not depending on those fossil fuels whose prices are controlled very often by persons or corporations that don't even reside in the United States. But back further back on your question about the um, these wind platforms, I do want to be very careful about where we place those because obviously they will have some effect on our fisheries. I don't know all the details of exactly how that's been worked out so far. I know there have been a number of, of meetings and gatherings to discuss these things, and I'm pretty sure that the call here off of Port Orford has been taken out of, of the lineup for for the um, the platforms. But I am very interested in, in getting involved in making these wind platforms work. We're going to need to generate electricity in some means other than fossil fuels. If elected, would you support the Oregon Department of Forestry's Western Oregon Habitat Conservation Plan. Do you think it adequately balances forest product industry interests with environmental interests? That's a tough one for me. I can give my opinion that I would certainly hope that the forestry industry would be involved in this, as well as the Department of Forestry, to find where that balance is. I definitely need to become more informed on this issue, but it is something that fascinates me as well as has my interest. Because we're, we're going to have to protect our forests. We're going to have to look at, at fire protection. Uh, we need to look at that as far as industry forests here along the coast in, in timber and in many other ways. So those that's something I'm going to have to study in a little bit deeper in, but I'm very open to, to any of those ideas. Sticking with his theme, do you think Oregon needs to do more to mitigate the changing climate's effects on Oregon's environment and economy, or should we allow market forces to prevail? What specific policies do you support or oppose? I think Oregon's doing a good job getting started, coming out of the gate. I do believe that we need to maintain some regulation and some oversight and letting market forces drive the investments and to start making that transition into to other fuels and other generations of power. Because obviously fossil fuel can't be our, our only thing. Wind power on its own and solar on its own aren't gonna work. And some of the new green or clean hydrogen that's uh, being investigated and being studied right now is something else we're going to have to look at. So I think this transition that we're gonna to have to make and protecting our climate here in Oregon and throughout the nation and the globe is we're gonna to have to work on these small pieces and joining them all together to, to make a plan and a project that will work for all of us on the planet. Rural counties in your district are struggling with a lack of resources for sheriff departments, local police, district attorneys, and public defenders. What, if anything, would you like to see the state legislature do to support law enforcement and the courts? Wow, that's, yeah, a really tough one. I, I think that our state legislature can do something to help support us out here. I know one of the issues here in Curry County, where I live, is supporting and paying for our sheriff's department and making sure that we have available officers 24-7. And there have been many different ways proposed to do that, some by a special task, uh, tax district and others just by raising our, our tax rates overall. I believe that the state can come up with some ways to help subsidize some of our more rural counties that have that lesser availability of, of revenues to help support those, those departments. And I support having our local police departments and our sheriffs be completely staffed. There's absolutely no reason that we can't have that happen, as well as our state police and our FBI. Law enforcement is very necessary for us to maintain our communities. What unique qualities and experience do you possess that make you the best candidate for this position? I think I have some on the ground experience that um, other folks may not. Um, I have been impacted by the housing shortage here on the coast. 
when I came to, to Port Orford, I lived with some very dear friends who allowed me, thankfully, to come and stay with them. Um, I was living in my RV on their property at the time and realized I wasn't going to be able to find a home. So I've learned to do with, and luckily it's me by myself having to do this, but having to do with smaller living space. And I do live in my RV. I've recently discovered by someone's definition, it was just a, a citizen here in Port Orford that I've discovered that I'm homeless because I live in my RV. I found that kind of interesting, <laughs> but we're going to have to come up with lots of different ways to help house people here. So housing is something that I, I do have a, a different view on. Um, healthcare is something that I've had to deal with while I, I've lived here as well, trying to put together some coverage with my doctor and to have a doctor that I can depend on and not have to use an emergency room to, to handle my health care. And often I have to make trips of more than a couple of hours to see a specialist or even to see a regular doctor when there's not one available here. Um, I also live on a fixed income. I do draw social security. So I have, and I've drawn social security disability. So I do have a unique insight as to some of the ins and outs of that whole ball of wax, if I may say, <laughs> call it that, um, and have been able to help other people work their way through that that maze of trying to get set up with that. So I, I do have some understanding of those things in the background. All right, so the next series of questions, you've already touched on parts of it, but the most important part of that we want you to answer is, do you think there is more, do you think that there's more funding needed from the state to help with the housing problem in our communities. Basically, the question is, how can the state government help local jurisdictions with this problem? I believe that funding is always going to help. I'm finding that communication around this issue is one of the places I'm finding more difficulty. Um, as the chair of the Curry County Democrats, I've gotten myself involved in paying attention to some of our local um, offices, one of them being our, our county commissioners, our board of county commissioners, and trying to tune into and pay attention to what they're working on and incentives that they're trying to provide to build some housing here in the county. And I'm finding that there's a lot of pushback from people that consider anyone who doesn't have a home currently doesn't shouldn't be here. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain that. They don't want homeless people living in our county. I think that if you can put a roof over someone's head, someone's head, they're not homeless any longer. So you've solved that problem right away. Uh, I think these are issues that are going to really need to be addressed on a more local level, such as our counties, maybe not so much our cities, but our counties definitely that can bring the funding from the state to the county to handle this problem. But it's something that we're going to have to do at the county level. And I'm willing to look at, this issue upside down and backwards. I've been asked this question a number of times exactly how I would do it. I don't have an exact answer at this point, but I know there are a lot of really smart, intelligent people already in the legislature. And I know a lot of really smart, intelligent people that live here in the county that are, are willing to give their two cents worth. I think that we can handle this. It's going to take us some work, but I think that if we put our heads together and start communicating in both directions, that we can start to solve this problem. What specific programs would you support to nurture stronger economies in the district? That's a really good question. And I've been giving this a, quite a bit of thought recently, and I keep coming back around to the people, back to the citizens, not only of the district, but of the entire state of Oregon. I believe that our economy is really based on people. Without people, obviously, our economy wouldn't exist. So the health and happiness, the well-being of the people that I'm going to stick to the first district within the district is going to drive our economy. If they're able and willing to come to work, if they have places to live so they're happy and healthy, our small businesses are going to have employees that can work there. Our small businesses and our large businesses will also have consumers, customers that will step into the businesses to help support them. So, I'm really interested in giving people, some people might want to say social programs. I want to put people at the center of this whole thing. I think business 
will support people, but we've got to make sure that we have the, the services and support for our humans on the ground so that they, they can perform at work and perform as a consumer out in our towns. What legislation, if any, would you support to make child care more affordable in Oregon? I would support any legislation that we can put together for that. And I know there's quite a shortage of that and a demand for it here um, along the Southwest Coast. There are a couple of programs that I am not familiar enough with, but I've had them explained to me that I think will work really well. There is some funding that's available we've got to pieces together again, it's going to be coming back to, to the communication and putting all the pieces together. And I know plenty of my own neighbors that have children that sometimes they can't go to work because they have their kids at home with them, young kids. So if parents can work, and again, that's coming back around to helping our businesses. If parents can go to work while kids are at school or in childcare, I think that we can really work on developing our local economy. What state policies would you support to make health care in general more affordable, as well as to make prescriptions cheaper? Now, I know that prescription prices, thank you, President Biden, for having worked on, on the, um, this latest bit of Inflation Reduction Act that's lowered um, prices for Medicare recipients specifically. And has lowered the price of insulin for seniors as well that are on Medicare. I think we need to expand that. I don't know if we can do that on the state level, but I think we could probably figure it out and expand that at least for our citizens in Oregon, if not give a little bit of a push and help us nationally to get that pushed across the finish line so that everybody has that, that same coverage. I know that, that Medicare, and I, I'm a Medicare recipient, that my prescription prices have just been creeping up over the years. And I'm really pleased to hear that President Biden has put in this um, Inflation Reduction Act the possibility for Medicare to uh, negotiate prices on these medications and that he's placed a $2,000 cap on my out-of-pocket expenses every month. So that will help me directly, and I think it will help a lot of other people, and I think that we can do it for the population as a whole. Money was allocated by the state legislature a few years ago to improve access to mental health and addiction care, but those programs have not yet been fully implemented. Meanwhile, access to mental health and addiction care has become more difficult, especially in our area. If elected, what would you do to improve this situation for constituents? That will be a big priority for me. Because again, mental care comes into our health care, along with our child care, all of those cares, it's gonna be people care. And I believe that, that mental health sits at the base of a lot of the difficulties that we have, um, especially in the district, but even statewide. Part of our, our law enforcement needs very often are mental health needs and not so much law enforcement needs. And I do understand that there's been quite a bit of um, of money set aside for, for this, this project. But what I'm hearing, especially here in Curry County, but throughout the district, is we have the money and we don't have a place to stand it up. So we've got to get to work on, and again, we're getting into to buildings. So do we have locations? We're having difficulty finding places for people to live now. We're having difficulty finding on the ground locations for our mental health care. And how are we gonna get staff to staff these places if we don't have somewhere for the staff to live? So again, I'm coming back to the housing and the building part of it. It affects all sides of that. So housing again is gonna be really central at this whole issue for all these issues for me. So that will be my priority. There is a measure on the, that will be on the Oregon ballot to prevent walkouts by legislators attempting to prevent votes on legislation they don't support. Would you vote for that measure? I will. will. You vote for that measure? It's going to be on my ballot on November 8th when I vote. I will vote for it. Uh, we're, we're elected to do a job, and I think we need to show up. 
and we're representatives. So I need to be there and represent whomever it is that I represent in the district. And I need to represent us in Salem and I need to represent our needs for whatever legislation's on the floor. If it's something that I don't agree with, I have to find a way to work with the people who are in charge of that. And it's gonna be about communication and representation in, in the House of Representatives to make these things happen. I don't think that bailing out on your job is the way to resolve anything. Some people wanna use that as a cudgel or a crowbar. I just don't think not talking about it and not taking a vote on things is really the way to go. Speak your mind, vote yes or no, yay or nay. Well, thank you for answering all those questions. And now you'll have two minutes for any closing remarks you might want to make. Again, thank you for giving me this forum to speak. In closing, I just want to quickly try and go over my most important priorities. You've heard me speak about housing. You've heard me speak about health. So human care, health care, reproductive care, child care, mental care, all those things are big issues for me and our planet, our environment, our climate. I've been watching what, how climates changed in the eastern part of our country, the impact that Hurricane um, Ian has had on Florida. And even with all the preparations, they've done really well in Florida to make sure they're ready for an emergency of that type there's still gaps to cover when a, uh, when a disaster like that happens. So there are people that are still waiting to be serviced, but they've set it up and they've made plans. I think that we can make plans here in our state of Oregon to help prepare us to house people better, to give them better health care, to make sure that we have fresh and sanitary water conditions and that we protect our, our watersheds are gonna be really big issues in, in the next coming years. In fact, they're big issues right now, but we need to get on top of them now for the future. And one other thing that I haven't heard a lot of discussion about during the campaign, but I keep trying to bring it up. And it's uh, a measure that we all voted on in 2020. And we all asked for campaign finance reform. I think it was 78% of Oregonians voted yes on that measure. I don't think that I can really effectively work as a representative if there's always that possibility that putting together the best legislation that somebody with a whole mess of money can come in and write a check and upset the whole apple cart, that one person or a small group of people can steer what goes on in our legislature by throwing money at it. So I support campaign finance reform along with uh, Tina Kotek. She's our nominee for our Democratic nominee for governor. She's gotten behind this too, and she wants to finish resolving this, this issue. I know it was put before the legislature um, last year during session, and it didn't pull all the way through. So I would like to see us finish that up because I think that'll be a really big deal for all of us as Oregonians. I only take donations from small donors for my campaign. Other than just to truth be told, I have accepted donations from my own county party and the Douglas County Democrats, so the Curry County Democrats, Douglas County Democrats, and Future PAC, who is in charge of on the state level, the House of Representatives of getting Democrats elected to the House. So those are my only not single person contributions that I've had to my campaign. So campaign finance is something that I will be working on very heavily. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cecil, for giving us your time so we can let the voters know um, by posting this on our website and uh, they can learn more about you and your positions. Thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity.